Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for staying the course. I know it's been an extremely uh, intense two days amidst everything else that everybody is doing. Um, I would like to welcome you to this session, uh, which is the fourth session of our conference and will focus on ELS at 25, the first 25 years of the East Africa Law Society. Uh, in this session, we will be trying to distill the philosophy behind the establishment of ELS 25 years ago. We will also be revisiting the vision of our founding mothers and fathers. We will try to signpost the journey that has been traveled to date, the progress we have made, the achievements, the challenges that we encountered, and how they were resolved. And finally, because we must be both backward looking as well as forward looking, we'll try to forecast the future outlook uh, of the society. In terms of how we'll structure the conversation, uh, we will start with the ELS president, Mr. Willy Rubea, who will make opening and welcoming remarks. Then one of our founder members, Mr. John Merimugisha, will give a keynote in which he will cover the history of the founding of ELS. He'll narrate its early years, and he'll be supported by other founding members, including Paul Wamai, senior counsel, who is uh, with us. Uh, then after that keynote, we will have a conversation uh, with about 10 conversationalists. And the whole idea is we'll just have a rolling conversation as East Africans, our seniors, women and men, colleagues who are there in the very beginning in 1995 and the period before, uh, colleagues who have joined along the way, they've been in the leadership, they've been in the membership, they've been in the active membership and so on. So we'll just have a conversation and towards the end of the conversation, we'll begin focusing on the current and the future. And throughout this conversation, we'll take questions and comments from you all participants. So from the very outset, we encourage you to use the chat function to also use the question and answer function as you have been doing in the earlier sessions. Uh, and all our conversationalists will be looking at that and I as moderator will be helping them to look at that so that we can respond to some of the questions, some of the insights, some of the reflections that you're putting in. Without further ado, uh, and I'm sorry that I did not uh, introduce myself when I started. My name is Donald Dare. I'm an advocate uh, originally from Kenya, but I like to identify now as a Pan-Africanist. Uh, the whole of Africa owns me and I feel I own the whole of Africa. I head the Secretariat of the East Africa, uh, the Pan-African Lawyers Union, PALU, which is based in Arusha in Tanzania. And I was also privileged years back between June 2002 and December 2009 to be the inaugural chief executive officer of ELS. Thank you very much. And I now welcome our president, Mr. Willy Rubert, to address us. Please unmute, Mr. President. I, th I, th I think now it's okay. Can you hear yes, me? Yes, now it's okay. Mr. Thank yes, you so now much. we can hear you. Thank you so much, Mr. Donald Bea. Good afternoon, uh, dear ELS members. Thank you, uh, thank you all for coming and joining here today, our annual conference and general assembly. I'm pleased to be able to welcome you as uh, we are celebrating our 25th anniversary and I'm proud and honored to share this meeting today. Just before we get started, I would like to express my gratitude to all of you who so generously with the professionalism and abnegation supported ELS to make those two years smoothly, fruitful, and enjoyable. My gratitude goes especially to the council members for the guidance, the support, and advice. To Amola Anington, ELS CEO, and each member of the secretariat 
put for the tremendous work and goals achieved. To our partners and leading law firms for their financial and technical support. You have all chosen to be a part of ELS, ELS because of our mutual passion, passion for promoting rule of law, human rights, and good governance in East Africa, promoting professional development in legal profession, developing institutional capacity of national bar associations and the regional bar, promoting regional integration of East African community, advising public interest advocacy. Your passion helps all of us to come together as one and the energy we create as one allows us to achieve our individual as well as our group goals. ELS, ELS needs us as much as we need it. And this is why I'm asking you to continue supporting the new council and sharing your experience with and within our law society in our respective countries. And ELS, as ELS council member, I'm keen that we value and cherish the friendship we make as the more often than no proof to be formed on a strong common ground, which in turn makes them last for many, many years to come. This afternoon, I'm glad to be joined by the founding members of the ELS and some of the past leaders who transformed the society and even the incoming leaders. I look forward to an exciting session covering the elegant story, history of our society and a projection of our, of our future. Thank you. Please, Mr. Donald, the mic is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And in order not to waste any more time, let me move directly to our senior, Mr. John Mary M. Mugesha, senior counsel, who will give us a keynote address on the history of ELS and the dreams for a regional association of lawyers. JMM, you're welcome. We still can't hear you yet, JMM. You seem to be still muted. Ah, okay. Hello? Is it okay now? That's better. We can Hello? Yes, we can hear you now. Hello? Do you yes, hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I'm saying I'm John Merem Chisa Senior Council. Uh, I'm greatly honored and exceedingly humbled to have been chosen by the leadership of the East Africa Law Society to deliver a keynote address on East Africa Law Society at 25 years of its existence. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Uh, Go right ahead, JMM. Okay. okay, my address will cover the historical background, the vision and mission of the founder members, the processes, achievements, challenges encountered along the way and the way forward. I have prepared some notes which will guide our conversation, but I will intend not to read them. I will simply give highlights. Uh, the historical background. Sometime in 1995, the US government under the aegis of the United States Information Agency invited bar leaders from Africa to visit the United States and see how bar associations were run so as to adopt the best practices. 
The Ugandan team was led by myself. And at, the, at that material time, I was the vice president of the Uganda Law Society. Other members of our delegation included uh, Mr. John Matovu, senior counsel, who at the time was the secretary of the Uganda Law Society. And our other member was Harriet Musinje, who was the CEO then. The Kenyan team was led by my land friend, Mr. Paul Wamai, senior counsel, who was the chairperson of the Law Society of Kenya. And other members were uh, the current Lady Justice, Dr. Luce Muthoni Kambuni, whom I understand is at the Hague. Lady Justice Martha Komi, who is now the Court of Appeal Justice. And the late Peter Mang, who was the CEO of the Law Society of Kenya. The Tanzanian team was led by the then president of the Tanganyika Law Society, the late Everest Habatumbuya. Other members were Mwana Idi Sinari Maja, who is currently the Tanzanian ambassador to the United States, Mrs. Elizabeth Minde, and Mr. Mohammed Ismail. So we were hosted by the National Bar Association of the United States. And during our stay, we visited various bar associations. And while on our flight from Miami to Washington, Mr. Mbuya, Mr. Wamai and I, who happened to be sharing a seat, conceived the idea of founding the East Africa Law Society. We held our inaugural meeting in Washington, D.C., subsequent meeting in Chicago, and finally New York, where we concluded a memorandum of understanding whose highlights were to bring together the lawyers from the region, from the respective bars, so as to form a formidable integrated law society, which would boost the legal profession anchor its independence, promote the rule of law, access justice, good governance, and constitutionalism. We were also aiming at augmenting the efforts of the East Africa community for integrating the community in all aspects, but with emphasis on cross-border legal practice, so as to serve the citizenry of the region of East Africa. The nascent leadership of the society would be rotational, and we resolved that ourselves would not be uh, the founder president. We also resolved that the secretariat would be located in Arusha, which we deemed as the capital of East Africa. And given the prevailing legal regime, we deemed it convenient to register our society in Tanzania as a company limited by guarantee. And it would also be registered as a foreign company in Uganda and Kenya. Our hosts were, be, were elated by this development. The USSIS, the United States government, and all of them promised to extend assistance to us. What are the processes? On the 26th of October, 1995, the East Africa Law Society was duly registered as a company limited by guarantee at the company's registry, Dar es Salaam. And it was subsequently registered in Kenya and Uganda as a foreign company. In 1996, with the assistance of the then president of the Law Society, Solo Mebalunji Bosa, who now is a justice at the ICC, we received some funding from the Ford Foundation with the assistance of Mr. Rather, Dr. William Tunga, the retired Chief Justice of Kenya, who at the material time was heading the Ford Foundation. 
we convened our inaugural general meeting at the Sheraton Kampala. And at that meeting, we approved our constitution, which apparently was embedded in the Articles of Association. The meeting uh, chose uh, Lady Justice Salome Borunji Bossa as the founding president. And the first council meeting was held in South Africa in 1996. Our mission then was to help to build a just, united, and integrated East Africa with human dignity and cultural diversity, where every person, irrespective of tribal or ethnic uh, group, would feel secure and had equal opportunity to realize his or her potential. Our vision was to foster social economic and political development of the people of East Africa, to disseminate information on human rights, rule of law, good governance and democracy in East Africa, to support the efforts that foster cooperation of East African countries and their people, and to contribute the building of democracy and good governance in East Africa. What was our membership? We resolved that our membership would be individual and the respective bars, and we agreed that our respective secretariats would serve as rallying points for collecting subscriptions and for mobilization purposes. Some of the notable members who were very instrumental at the beginning of the society uh, included from Kenya, just but to name a few, Paul Mwiti, retired justice Dr. William Mutunga, the late Honorable Mirugi Kariuki, former minister, assistant minister of foreign affairs, Mr. David Maraga, who happens to be the chief justice of Kenya, Justice Catherine Mamunoti, who is of the Court of Appeal of Kenya, Justice Asike Makendia, who is also part of the Kenyan Court of Appeal, Justice Wilfred Mabea, and last but not least, Professor Tom Odiambo Ojienda, a leading academic. Of course, there were other personalities like Dr. Gibson Kamau Korea and uh, Mr. Otiende Amoro. And of course, Donald Dare, who was very instrumental. And I've forgotten the late Mr. Nzamba Kitonga. Uganda, we had Justice Sol Mebosa, Professor Sempewa, Justice Reme Kasule, Justice Drete Borion, and past presidents Andrew Kasirie, Musoke Harriet Diana, Mukasa Semugenyi, and Dr. Alan Sonubi. From Tanzania, we had Mr. Coleman Mark Ngalo, the late Chief Wilfred Mirambo, the late Moses Maira, Method Kemogoro, Honorable Lawrence Mosha, Justice Mujurizi, and Mr. Tom Nyanduga, who happened also to be past president of the East African Law Society. From Zanzibar, we had the late Professor Harud Othman. Mr. Nasur Mohammed, Mr. Ali Saleh, and Mr. Salum Tofik. There are several other names I would have mentioned, but because of time, you will find them in my write-up. What are our achievements so far? Since its inception, the East Africa Law Society has made several strides. It has carried out several activities, holding seminars, workshops, conferences throughout East Africa, they were initially conducted within the past, the three East African partner states, but subsequently we extended to the rest of the bigger East Africa as it is conceived now. Our workshops cover a period of 1996 up to the present, but some of the early notable ones were held in 1996 for judges and advocates on the Bill of Rights, Constitutionalism, this was held in Mombasa. The role of lawyers in regional integration, it was held in 97. We held a workshop for lawyers and diplomats 
on uh, the East African Treaty, which at that time was in draft. In 2003, we focused on the East Africa Legislative Assembly. We also held conferences on peace, stability, and conflict resolution, on regional preparatory conference for world conference against racism. In 2003, linkages between the East African Court of Justice and the national courts. In 2005, we were celebrating the East Africa Community Integration Opportunities, Challenges, and Potential Impact of Trade in Services to East African Lawyers within the World TO and GATS regime. In 2005, a topic which is very close to my heart, cross-border legal practice in East Africa, some discrete reflections in integrating the practice of law in East Africa, standardizing the criteria for admission to law practice in the region. In uh, 2006, we again looked at the protocol on the African Charter on Human Rights. 2009, we looked at integration. 2011, positioning legal profession in the regional integration process. 212, legal profession as a vehicle for investment and trade. 2014, advancing the legal profession. 2015, Chigari Rwanda mutual recognition agreements. 2016, enhancing business competitiveness through greater democratization. 2017, future proofing the legal profession. And most recently, the ESC at 20, the role of law and lawyers in developing regional economic uh, committees. As you can see, the society has been very instrumental in participating in uh, informing its members about these developments. What about the membership? Initially, our membership was uh, restricted to the founders and the original members who participated in our activities. But as I talk, the membership has grown by leaps and bounds. We are boasting of over 10,000 individual lawyer members, and we are boasting of seven national bars members. These are Burundi Bar Association, Rwanda Bar Association, Law Society of Kenya, Tanganyika Law Society, South Sudan Law Society, Uganda Law Society, and Zanzibar Law Society. It should be recalled that during our early stages, we spent special delegations to Burundi and Rwanda for membership drive. Surprisingly, the legal fraternity in those countries has now proved to be more enthusiastic than the original members. The Rwanda Bar has on several occasions volunteered to host activities of Law Society of Kenya, which were scheduled for other countries. We now boast of a permanent home, a secretariat which is now located uh, plot six corridor area of Jan Road, Arusha, Tanzania, which is now fully staffed under the able stewardship of Mr. Huntington Amor. The society has also established linkages. As we talk, it has earned credibility within the first the five East African states, and it has lawyers uh, who are respected. It has also uh, massive knowledge about the human rights of the region. It has acquired observer status at the East Africa community, and it has unparalleled competence in East Africa community law including litigation uh, at the court. It has played a key role in the rule, the rule of law, human rights, and regional integration. It has acquired continental leakages 
with various institutions, such as Coalition for Effective African Court on Human and People's Rights, CESC, SADC Lawyers Association, and the West African Bar Association. It has partnership with the Canadian Bar Association, the Law Society of England and Wales. It has active membership and networking initiatives with the Pan-African Lawyers Union, PALU, the Commonwealth Law Society, Law, Law Association rather, the International Bar Association, the International Institute of Law Association of Chief Executives. It has participated actively in regulation, drafting, and eventual signing of the East Africa Treaty for establishing the East African community. It has continued to be an active intervener and supporter of the East Africa community and the partner governments in regional cooperation and integration. It was instrumental in the establishment of the protocol to operationalize the enhanced jurisdiction of the East African Court of Justice. It has acted as a catalyst with regard to the developments at the African continental level with initiatives and activities targeting the African Union, the African Court of Human and People's Rights, and the African Court of Human and People's Rights, and the new Partnership for Africa Development, NEPAD, and the African Peer Review Mechanism. It has continued to attract participation at all workshops and conferences, and all our AGMs attract big numbers. The society has encouraged the twinning of law firms. It has promoted the emergence of leading law firms. It has promoted creation of chapters of young lawyers, women lawyers, which are intended to address the specific needs of their respective memberships. It has come to condemn excesses meted out by partner states of this African community and has intervened to protect local bars and the legal fraternity when they face political challenges. The society has been commissioned on several occasions to observe elections in partner states. The society has provided conducive environment for the individual lawyers, especially those who litigate at the East African Court of Justice. It has published uh, several publications such as the Law Reports, Law Digests, notably the Constitutional Law Digest, which contain useful precedents for the legal fraternity. We also have our newsletter, which has also got wide readership. The society has since undergone a metamorphosis. As we talk, the mission, vision, and core values have now been transformed and enhanced. The current vision now is an integrated, sustainable regional bar association, which promotes and advocates for professionalism, democracy, human development, and its current mission is to facilitate, enhance, and harmonize the development of the legal profession, promote good governance, the rule of law, human rights, through capacity building and partnerships in pursuit of improved human development in the region. Our core values, as I talk now, are professionalism, accountability, transparency, integrity, and gender equality. What have been our challenges ever since our inception? Our challenges at the beginning we are regarding the secretariat. We had a difficulty in harmonizing the operations of the ALS secretariat with those of the local bars. Sometime in 2002 and 2000, 2001, 2002, the secretariat had to be closed because of some misunderstandings between the then leadership of the East Africa Law Society and one of the local bars until the impasse was amicably resolved by me, the speaker. I think I take credit for that. We have also had 
problem with payment of subscription fees regarding the amount payable, regarding the collection, the remittance from the respective bars and individuals. We have also had mutual suspicions between the local bars and the society and struggle for supremacy or space. We have also had problem with the membership of the executive council. The number has been very big, costly to maintain, especially regarding rotational meetings. Some individual lawyers are still skeptical about the membership benefits. They always ask us what do we earn when we belong to the society. We have also had problem with cross-border legal practice, which though good intentioned has been viewed with mutual suspicion and prejudices. Apart from Kenya and Uganda, other countries are still procrastinating as far as passing the laws for regulating cross-border practice as envisaged under the ELS are concerned. What then is the journey ahead or the way forward? As a founder member, by and large, I'm very happy with the developments. When we conceived the idea, we never imagined that it would be such a formidable society as it is now. For the betterment of the society, I would recommend to the membership that we should build on the achievements that we have accumulated so far, so as to overcome the challenges, some of which I have highlighted above. I would recommend that there is a need to strengthen the secretariat by retaining a well-motivated staff. There is a need for the membership to be urged to pay the requisite membership fees and subscription for sustainability purposes. There is a need for collection and transmitting of the fees in a streamlined manner. There is a need to rationalize the membership of the executive council so as to reduce its cost. There is also a need to sensitize our membership about the benefits of belonging to this society. There is also a need to lobby partner states to pass laws to anchor cross-border legal practice and conduct legal literacy for the membership and the citizenry at large so as to embrace our society. So in conclusion, I think we were very uh, ambitious in conceiving the idea and I'm very glad that we have been vindicated by the activities that the society has accomplished. And we are very happy to see that what we thought was a very small idea has now uh, culminated in a formidable society. And I think we are now the biggest professional body in the region. So I would like to thank all those who have given us a hand, especially our funders. I would also like to thank the membership, especially the local bars who have embraced the idea. And also, I would also like to thank the membership. You have not been skeptical, but you have embraced the society. And I would like to appeal to all of you to ensure that we scale further, further heights and the sky should be the limit. Once again, I would like to thank the leadership who chose me to speak today and thank all of you for having listened attentively. And I hope we shall interface in the form of questions and answers. Thank you very much. Asante Nisana Kwa over to you, Mr. Thank you very much, Senior Counsel John Mary Mugesha. You've told us many, many things. It's quite sentimental, but also inspiring to hear what was your original vision and the journey. 
A few remarkable things that I get from what you've said. One, equality. That you ladies and gentlemen purposely chose to start ELS on a very strong ground of equality between male and female lawyers, between senior counsel uh, and slightly younger counsel. If I even look at the composition of your famous trip to the US and I look at the three countries, you made sure you had female and male, young and old. Another thing that I pick from you is regional representation. When I look at the delegations in those early years, even for that trip, we had a tendency then of just taking people from the capital city where the majority of the bar is. But you always made sure that you had in T Tanzania, Dar es Salaam represented, Mwanza, Arusha, Zanzibar. In Kenya, you would have Nairobi represented, Mombasa, Nakuru, which is where David Maraga came from, Kisumu, and so on, Eldoret, it was quite good. A third thing that I pick is the very international outlook that you had from the outset. Your first series of discussions were held while in transit from Miami to Washington DC, to Chicago, to New York, which is where you signed your first MOU. The first formal meeting was in Durban, South Africa on the side of everything else. Then of course, you did Kampala, Mbarara, Dar es Salaam, Arusha, Zanzibar, Nairobi, Mombasa, and later on Kigali, Bujumbura, and so on. So you're quite international in the outlook. The fourth thing which you have uh, 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 emphasized for me is self-sustenance, that you, our founding mothers and fathers, ensured that from very early, you persuaded the ordinary lawyer from Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda to remove something small, something small each, so we could run our own affairs and be not dependent entirely on donors. That was quite, quite unique for the time. And others like Sadak lawyers and so on came and learned from you. And others like our colleagues from WABA, the West African Bar Association, who didn't learn as much, are still suffering now. Uh, the fifth thing, and that's the final thing I will say, JMM, you've given us a very solemn uh, rendition. But you didn't talk about the fun. From what I remember, there was also quite a lot of fun you gentlemen and ladies would go out together, eat together, drink together, party together, go on excursions together after the work, invite each other to your homes, introduce your colleagues to your spouse, spouses and children. So I think there was that strong thing there also that we should talk about. Having said that, let me go to one of the other founder people who signed that first MOU, who are on those flights from Miami to DC to Chicago, to New York and those first meetings. I welcome you, our senior, Paul, who are my senior counsel. Maybe take two, three minutes and just add on to what he has said as we open up the conversation and make it more conversational. Karibu mze. Um, sorry, if I was not heard before. Um, yes, we good can afternoon, now. fellow lawyers of West Africa. Sorry, Mze, the camera is cutting you a bit. If you could move it a bit to the center so we see you better, but we can hear you. Yeah, that's a bit better. Can you see, can you see me now? Then tilt it a bit. Yes, we can. Go right ahead. Yeah. Um, it is my, I, I, I thank the Secretary of the South African Law Society <clears throat> for giving me the honor of saying a few words to the lawyers of East Africa Law Society. I would like to thank Mr. John Miriam Bogisha, to whom I send my greetings, the founder, one of the founder members, and who has been very active throughout the life of the East Africa Law Society so far, for such an elaborate history of East African Law Society. I'm very impressed, Mr. John Mirimogisha, for all what you have said. And as you had been so well summarized by Mr. Donald Dare, so that I do not want to bore the members of the meeting by repeating much of what you have said. I will simply highlight some aspects of history 
of East Africa Law Society. <coughs> East Africa Law Society, as Ms. John Bogisha has said, was born in Washington in May 1995. At that time, in one evening, we just went to a room where, which was empty, and the chairs were pushed to, one, to the walls. We pulled those chairs, made some kind of around, around, around conference that was notable, there were notables. And uh, I was requested to make the first introduction, which I did. And I was very impressed by the way those members from East Africa, uh, the delegate which Ms. Um, Mary Mogisha has given the names, I don't have to repeat, received it so well the idea of forming East Africa Law Society. And we agreed that we all go back to our respective countries and ensure that it was established. At that meeting, I was sort of made an acting, an acting president of the Law Society. And uh, I, was a, I was the chairman of the Law Society of Kenya, currently called president of the Law Society of Kenya in the company of other delegates, which Mr. John Miriam Mugisha has stated. And our, our, we are very passionate about the society. We wanted to assist in the formation of the community founded on law. And we also wanted to create a forum of interaction amongst lawyers of East Africa Whereas Mr. Leia has, Leia has said, we could socialize and know each other. And we also wanted to ensure that we build a body that will be respected by all the East Africa governments, as well as the world community. We are very passionate about supporting the formation of the community so that it could be in the long run a federation which could have one government and also various, and also ministries of that government. Uh, that has not of course materialized to the extent that we wanted. And we are all quite keen on our mission, which Mr. John Miriam Mogisha has said, and that was actually opening up practice in East Africa countries. So that although each country could have its own law and, and regulate the terms of, adm of um, admission of an advocate to that respective country, that, which should be reasonable, we should be able to practice in East Africa. That to my understanding is an idea that is to be put into fruition, except as Ms. John Mary Mogisha has correctly said, uh, Kenya and Uganda have opened up their practices. I'm not able to understand what the other countries are afraid of, because obviously for a Kenyan to leave Kenya and go and practice out of the country, it is not likely that will be better known by the citizens of that country. And secondly, there is a good, there can be a reason for one to wish to practice if you come from Tanzania in Nairobi, or if you are from Nairobi or Kenya, you will choose to practice in Uganda or Rwanda for personal reasons that should have been open. This idea of course came to us when we were in the US. And we are the guests, as we, as we have been told by Ms. Yon Mary Mugisha, of the National Bar Association, which gave us a number of lectures, workshops, which are very informative on the practice and the management of the law. Not only that, they invited us to do, uh, to, to, to do twinning so that some of our lawyers could go and work in US, they attached US firm, US firms, 
uh, with a view of learning that kind of from that jurisdiction, are there to good design lawyers here to join us? That is an idea that has not yet been carried out. And it's a very good idea that should have been followed up. Because from what I saw, the practice there of law, with all due respect to lawyers of East Africa, is far much more advanced. And I think this idea should be carried on by the current leadership of the East African Law Society and be pursued for the benefit of East African lawyers. It will be one of the benefits, I presume, of lawyers in East Africa so that they can be more encouraged to participate. It should also, we should also consider whether we should not, instead of asking that individual members be subscription, whether we should not find a way of having the bar associations sort of um, within, within the reasonable levels, increase their subscriptions so that a portion of that could be channeled to South Africa Law Society. Some kind of making the Secretary of South Africa Law Society a part of these bars collectively. So I would not like to say too much on uh, more than that because I don't want to water down anything that John Miriam Mugisha has said. And I will leave the members to feel free to ask the question. Suffice to add, as Ms. John Miriam Mugisha decided, that we said that in order that people may feel have a sense of belonging, we the founder members who are in New York would not necessarily have to take up the leadership of the society. So when we went to Kampala for the first formal meeting, and I was the acting president, some members thought I would continue being the president of the law society. But of course, I did decline. And um, Bosa, who is the president of the Law Society, took over the leadership of the first president of East Africa Law Society. And she led very well. So I would like to stop there, ladies and gentlemen, and leave it open to you, just in case you have any questions to put. That Thank is, you uh, very much, Mzewa Mai. Yeah, and as we said, we, we want this to be a conversation. So we want our colleagues, young and old, to also be able to chime in initially by text, but maybe towards the end, we allow participants also to take the floor virtually. Next, I'm going to invite Honorable Martha Wangari Karua, who was also there in those early days. She was also one of those hystericals. Uh, and she may tell us a number of things, especially, you know, you can talk about the difficult political times that we were living in then and how ELS was also partly our response as a profession to the challenging times of the region. Uh, before I hand over the floor, let me at least give a few apologies of colleagues who couldn't join us. Ambassador Mwanaidi Maja, who as you heard, uh, was the one who did the first registration, her law firm did the first registration of, PAL, of ELS uh, way back in 95. Uh, and unfortunately, also her older sister, Dr. Eve Hawasinari, both of them had medical appointments this afternoon and they couldn't join us. Uh, also, somebody else who couldn't join us was there in those early days, as uh, JMM mentioned, was Bahame Tom Nyanduga, who ended up being the fifth president of ELS, but had been on the board before that. Uh, and Ms. Pamela Mwikali Tutui from Kenya, she also just got an emergency. Earlier on, she had confirmed uh, I apologize that I wasn't personally able to reach out to our second president, Coleman Mark Ngalo. He's in uh, semi-retirement, so you have to really go to look for him. And also to Chief Wilfred Mirambo, who has been in court this week. But having said that, I now invite your Honorable Martha Karua to also give us two, three minutes your insights of the period uh, and of our journey to date. Karibu. Thank you, and uh, I salute the leadership, the organizers, panelists, and participants. May I also say that uh, I'm very happy with the overview that has been given by Senior Counsel um, Mary Mogisha and uh, the added comments by Paul Mamai. 
now that uh, Donald asked that we talk about the political situation of when we began, I think there was the wave of change in East Africa. Kenya had just returned to multipartism. There hadn't been change of regime. And we were therefore struggling between the old and the new. There was progress. I think in Uganda, they were doing better than we were doing in terms of uh, democracy. The same in uh, uh, Tanzania. And uh, I'm comparing that with today and seeing that we've gone full circle because all three, uh, all East African countries have made progress, but we all seem somehow to be moving backwards, at least from my view on matters of uh, constitutionalism, democracy, and the rule of law. The very noble objectives of the East Africa Law Society, which are also the core objectives of the East Africa community, at least some of the fundamental principles. And my question today is, we have moved this far. What more can we do to help our sub-region and consequently Africa and the world? Because whatever we do today in our sub-region will impact others elsewhere. And I'm thinking that uh, one would want to see the East Africa Law Society play a more critical role or a more visible role in calling out when our countries are falling short on respect for human rights and democracy. I don't know whether we did it, but I remember looking out on Twitter when recently Madame Patma Karume was dis, um, disbarred in Tanzania in unclear circumstances. I was waiting to hear the voices of the bar. And this is just an example of one incident. We would want to hear the voice of East Africa bar where during election time in our countries, the leadership is behaving as though there is no constitution and oppressing the opposition and not following the constitution and the laws of our countries. Is it possible for us to be more vocal to um, ensure that our objectives are met? We have sibling rivalry among our countries. It's a love-hate relationship. We belong to East Africa, yet we are doing uh, oppressive things to individuals who have ventured either into business or visiting each other's country. What can we do? as a profession to help manage this sibling rivalry. I'm very much aware that this is not a political organization, but how can we use the law to make inroads in the sticky areas? Because if we let our countries deteriorate further than we already, where we already are, we are soon going to find it very difficult to even operate as professionals. Personally, I was called to activism because of the oppression that was in Kenya during my youthful years. I am seeing now all of us sliding in different um, degrees towards our dark past. What is it that we can do as lawyers? I don't want to go on and on. I just want to say this is a noble initiative a very noble conversation that we are having about our subregion, about our countries, about constitutionalism, the rule of law and democracy. And one of the biggest indicators that we are sliding backwards is the removal of term limits. And I think I can now say at least half the countries and signs that it may be the trend in the rest of the countries. Countries improve by peer pressure, by best practices, by copying each other where they are doing well. 
I do not know which country now can be seen as the champion of democracy and human rights in East Africa. I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Karua. There's even no way to try and paraphrase that. I'd just like to jump a bit now. We've heard now from Uganda about the formative years, from colleagues from Kenya about the formative years, and I'd like to jump now to a senior colleague uh, from Tanzania, and that is the Honorable uh, Justice uh, Joaquin Antoinette de Mello. Uh, Justice de Mello is a woman of many firsts. She was the first female president of the Tanganyika Law Society. So while she had older sisters who had been very prominent in the society, such as the Sinari sisters and others, she was the first whom the members elected. Something else, uh, she was there at the very beginning uh, in her own right as a leader in the profession and also um, working with and assisting her then law firm partner, Bahame Tom Nyanduga, who became our fifth president in the period 2005 to 2007 in their law firm as it then was. So that law firm of Nyanduga, Dimelo and Ringo is one of the ones that has the distinction of having produced two presidents of TLS, because Bahama had also been previously president of TLS and also ELS. So I welcome you, uh, uh, Justice Dimelo, to also give us a few words about your feeling of the first decade, the beginning of the second decade. Thank you. This is Dimelo. This is Dimelo. I can see that um, your mic is there. Uh, your video is not, and we can't hear yet. Your mic is muted. Okay, I'm going to ask the team to call Justice DiMello direct. David, please call her direct and find out if she might be facing challenges. Uh, internet, you know, of course, is sporty all over the world. It's something we've been suffering from. Uh, as we wait to get her, I'm now going to call possibly the youngest person on today's uh, panel, Anne Abeja. Anne and I and a couple of others started out as the young tax. Uh, of uh, the ELS. Before we had a secretariat, you know, uh, the leaders would raise money and buy tickets um, and go to meet in various places. And team, I can see something is going wrong with the, um, somebody's trying to like almost display a video. Uh, but yeah, so the likes of Anna Beja, the likes of Otienda Molo, the likes of Don Dea, we used to be the ones who'd be called the handbag carriers and the briefcase carriers for much older sisters and brothers who are organizing things. We'd run around getting things done, doing logistics, rapporteuring at meetings and so on. And then Anne entered leader, uh, in the leadership of ELS, uh, in the elected leadership of ELS in various roles, uh, all the way to vice president. So Anne, just give us a sense of your own journey and some of your insights of some of our, you know, the steps we took, our ups and downs. Welcome. Thank you, Don. Um, good afternoon to my fellow panelists and uh, the membership of the East Africa Law Society. First off, let me say that Don is um, telling a fib. Uh, he was the bag carrier and I was the instructor. So, but it, that's okay, that's okay. So first off, uh, Mr. President Willy Rubea, let me take the opportunity to congratulate you and all the members of the East Africa Law Society upon our Silver Jubilee. 
I think that um, uh, Senior Counsel, Mr. John Mary Mugisha has done a wonderful job of setting the scene by uh, giving us a background of where we came from, uh, which really helps anyone who has not been a part of uh, the East Africa Law Society to have an in-depth uh, understanding of uh, the vision that you are founding uh, fathers uh, and mothers had for the society. I also thank uh, Senior Counsel, Mr. Paul Wamai, uh, Honorable Martha Karua, um, you know, for the additional comments as well, which puts into context uh, what we're discussing here. So my journey uh, with the East Africa Law Society commenced, I should say in about uh, 2003, I was quite curious about what the East Africa Law Society had to offer. So uh, I heard about it and wanted to understand. Unfortunately, I was late for the um, annual general meeting, which was at the Sheraton Kampala. So I thought the following year I'll do a bit better and um, uh, get there in time. And I think uh, the 2004 meeting was in Mombasa, but I wasn't able to go. So my real journey began in Dar es Salaam in 2005 at the Morgan Peak, where I had the opportunity to attend all the meetings uh, and listen in on what the um, senior members of the bar then had to share with us. And since then, um, I've been a very ardent member of the East Africa Law Society. So in 2006, uh, in Munyonyo, I was elected as a um, council member representing Uganda. And uh, then my journey really began. And that also happened to be here when we uh, agreed, um, we resolved as the uh, East Africa Law Society to increase the subscriptions from $20 to $50. Of course, that uh, did not, um, go down well with all the members and it took so, a bit of time. You uh, and uh, Patrick, did you please mute yourself or uh, admin? Please can you help mute uh, Patrick so we don't interrupt? Uh, and... Thank you, thank you very much. So uh, the intention of increasing the subscriptions was to be able to support the programs or to supplement the programs that the society had because at the time there was a lot of donor funding coming in, but then we were also sensing that the, there was donor fatigue uh, and a lot of this funding comes uh, with strings tied to particular programs. Uh, but we tracked on from there and then Moving on swiftly in um, 2000 and uh, I think from 2006 to 2008, I was a council member, 2008 to 2010, I was a deputy secretary general. Um, and then uh, 2010 to 2012, secretary general, 2016 to 2018, uh, closed my tour of duty as the um, Vice President in charge of regional integration. It was an interesting journey because uh, we were able to achieve a lot within the different countries that we went to. I served with four different uh, presidents, uh, Professor uh, Tom Ogenda, and then I served with Dr. Alan Shonubi, uh, Dr. Wilbert Kapinga, and then with Mr. Richard Mugisha, who is a panelist here today as well. And with each team, we were able to agree on what our focus areas were and what we were going to achieve. Um, but that I know you can read from all the material that's available. Perhaps my uh, greatest joy was being a part of the team that brought on board our seventh institutional member, and that's the South Sudan Bar Association. We, I was the leader of the fact-finding mission to South Sudan in 2018. We were able to meet with the, uh, all the members of the different factions there, members of the judiciary uh, and different opinion leaders over there. We had some very good engagements and we shared about what the vision of the uh, law society is. What I must say, and I should say as I wind up, Don, 
is that uh, the East Africa Law Society prides itself in being ahead of our uh, of the partner states when it comes to making decisions. When uh, Rwanda Bar Association, as it was known then, uh, sorry, Kigali Bar Association and Burundi Bar joined the EALS, the, the states had not yet moved ahead. We still had only Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda as partner states to the EAC. So the EALS led uh, uh, in terms of uh, integration, which is uh, one of our, our key uh, our points of action. So I think I'll stop there for now in terms of my journey, and I'll be happy to uh, come in again and share. Thank you very much, Don. Over to you. Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, and I think we now have sorted out our technologies with uh, the Honorable uh, Justice uh, Joaquin DiMello. And I'd like to welcome you now, Justice DiMello, also to give us your initial remarks of uh, your recollection of that journey. So we're holding on for Justice DiMello. Maybe you come on board now. Okay. Uh, I think Justice DiMello will still see when you can bring you on board. Uh, I think another person that I can call at this stage, when we try to link the first 10 years, that's 1995 to 2005, and the period thereafter, also when you try to link the period before 2010 and the period after 2010, which will bring us more to the contemporary age, is Rosalie Nodede. Rose Nodede, I think, also served on the ELS governing bodies, from way back early 2003s into the early 2010s. Uh, and she was, you could say, a bit of the initial young face of ELS after the generation of the JMMs, the Nzamba Kitongas, the Watt, and so on. Uh, so, Rosalind, welcome. So, welcome, Rosie. Unmute and just give us your own feeling of the journey, especially as we now move from the first generation to other generations, and we're now handing over to even people coming after us. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Don, and the organizers of this conference uh, for honoring with me with an invite to share my experiences. Um, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well, Rosie. Thank you very much. So my, my journey and time at ELS was a very pleasant time. Everybody has been very serious <laughs> about their engagement with ELS, but we had lots and lots of fun times uh, at ELS. I think I traveled the whole of East Africa uh, with ELS and sharing very, very fond memories with my colleagues, council members, and the bar across the region. I have friends all over East Africa just because of ELS. And with ELS, I've also almost been shot. I've al almost I've run away and evacuated myself from Burundi. So it's been a fun time, and it's been an up and down experience. Uh, ELS was a very beautiful place to be, a place to learn and grow. Uh, we had engagements that were beyond national engagements. I remember at the time we joined the uh, ELS, the uh, East Africa community was just uh, setting up. Uh, we did a lot in terms of helping them develop their protocols and just uh, making the region integrate. And those were very, very deep and big steps. And I think uh, that's part of how I developed my governance instincts and uh, things around governance. And I think that was very, very uh, instrumental. Uh, and something I, I got and earned from ELS. Uh, ELS as well, <laughs> as Don said, we were the bank carriers, but not quite indeed. 
Well, we did a lot of work. I remember one day I was just about to board a flight and then Don calls me and says, Rosie, uh, can you present tomorrow? I don't have a speaker for this topic. And I'm like, huh? And he says, no, 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 no. You don't need a presentation, just talking points. And I'm like, okay, it's all right. So I go to this place and uh, Don in his usual colors, instead of allowing me to prepare my presentation at night, he takes us on a, an inventory of the town we were in. Uh, there's a way we used to take inventory. So we go and take inventory, come back home and sleep, and it's rather late. So waking up in the morning and walking into this conference where I was supposed to just present, I find a room full of professors from all across East Africa, serious looking gentlemen, double my age. And I'm like, OMG, Don has cooked me. He's fried me all together. <laughs> Don, I hope you remember this and you still owe me. So those are some of the journeys. I managed to put together a presentation and somehow I wowed the professors, but that was ELS. We would do it, we'd do it all. Uh, we'd do the hard work and we'd do the fun part. And those are the things we did. Uh, with ELS, we engaged uh, heads of states uh, across the East African region as well. And I really, really uh, hear what my senior Honorable Martha Karua says around how we have fallen from grace. Uh, we have totally, totally fallen from grace because in those days we were able to hold heads of states and countries to account and our voices were really listened to and held in high esteem. And I think it's time that we rethought and re-strategized on how to re-engage on these areas. I think the other thing I want to pick out about ELS, Dawn, is gender. Uh, ELS has always been a gender-friendly environment. There have always been spaces for women and men uh, to take up leadership, to take up opportunities to train. And I think it's been a very wonderful place and space for gender. And I wish our bar associations would embrace the principles that ELS has around gender. I think those would be enough for now, Don. Thank you very much for inviting me and allowing me to share some of these anecdotes from our past. Asante Sana. Thank you very much, Rosie. Yes, and I know I still owe you for the traumas that uh, we put you through uh, in those early years, uh, being a bar leader, our boss, but also the person that we call upon when things fail, when speakers fail to turn up at the last minute and you're looking, who is a dynamic person that can take almost any topic and will be courageous enough to fashion a useful discussion out of it for very long, you're one of the top favorites of the secretariat. I don't know, you will inform us, uh, uh, the host, David and group, whether you've been able to sort out the clashes with um, the technology uh, for Honorable um, uh, Justice DeMello. But I want to kick us now into the last 10 years, into the post notice. Uh, and I'd like to come to our 10th president, uh, Richard Mugesha. Uh, and Richard is many things, and that is not to say that the presidents before him did not try to focus a lot on making the members, especially the practicing members, especially business and commercial law, to also be at the center of our work. But Richard worked quite hard on that, as did others before him, I did Dr. Alan Shunubi and so on. But Richard was also among the very first lawyers that ELS met uh, in 2005, 2006, when we're going on our familiarization tours, our solidarity missions used to call them as a precursor to welcoming our colleagues to join us. So I'd like to invite you, Richard, to focus on this and also just focus on what you think were some of the highlights of your presidency, what were some of the achievements there as we begin now focusing also on what we want to do towards our future. So both backwards and forwards. Welcome, President Richard Mugesha. Uh, thank you, Don, for, for the introduction and for allowing me to, to share a few uh, thoughts about uh, as we commemorate our 25th uh, years of ELS. And um, like others before me, I wish to congratulate our president, uh, Willie Gouveia, and the governing council and all the members on uh, this milestone. I believe that uh, uh, the ELS 
is a very critical institution for the East African region. And uh, notwithstanding the challenges that we have sometimes faced, I think it is really critical that we remain steadfast because um, we have a very important role to play. Uh, the East African project may be uh, struggling a bit right now, but it is an essential project. Uh, in fact, I would dare say it's even an existential project for us East Africans. So um, uh, it's, uh, it's important that notwithstanding the challenges we have uh, faced, we continue to work hard at it. Now, um, when my colleagues and I assumed leadership of uh, ELS in 2016, we found a number of challenges. Key among them was the fact that the institution was seriously underfunded. We had a dissatisfied membership, which was beginning to question whether ELS has any value for them. We particularly had a much younger uh, membership that was not um, uh, familiar with the historical context leading to uh, the formation of ELS. And therefore, they were beginning to present serious challenges to their bar leaders about what is in it for them as, uh, as an organization, uh, rather as members. And listening to all these things and uh, discussing with my colleagues, the bar leaders in the region, we thought that we had to go back to the drawing board and come up with a, a roadmap that would try to address all the concerns that had been raised and to also ensure that we are, build, we are putting the institution on a path of sustainable growth. And uh, it was against that background that we engaged um, in a strategic planning exercise, a uh, five-year strategic planning exercise, which uh, involved the gathering of views from a cross-section of members across the entire region. And we came up with a number of key uh, components of the of, 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 of the plan which with the, the the interests of the various members being at the center of everything that we that we did at, at ELS and so we came up with a number of initiatives which we thought um, could hold the society together even if there were growing co uh, pressures to have membership become optional uh, as opposed to mandatory. We thought that if we had a number of initiatives which would be of interest to the members, then it would not really matter. People would still be happy to be part of VLS regardless of whether it's uh, mandatory or not. And key among the, the major um, uh, developments were the establishment of the ELS Institute. And this is an institute uh, which is aimed at exclusively providing services to our members and to other organizations uh, in the region. Through the ELS Institute, we were able to um, conduct several uh, targeted um, uh, capacity building initiatives to our members across the region. Uh, and in the process also generated uh, funding uh, for the organization. So in a sense, the ELS Institute was beginning to help us address two uh, key challenges. One, which was presenting real value to the members but secondly, also uh, uh, generating some income to address the financing gaps that had been identified. Um, because many of the, of the activities that we held under the Institute required people to travel, 
uh, we found that it was still a, a challenge for, for, for the majority of our members. And that led us to the establishment of the, the electronic version of the Institute through which um, activities are, are conducted without people having to travel. And uh, um, as many of you have witnessed during this period when many of our countries were under a strict lockdown, uh, ELS continues to, to, to serve the membership um, remotely. We also initiated um, uh, the ELS lecture series. This was an initiative which was aimed at linking uh, the older fraternity with the younger ones. Uh, and we found that there were very many uh, senior lawyers that were willing to, uh, some of them even at their own cost, to travel across East Africa to deliver lectures to, uh, to the membership. Uh, it was also both um, a capacity building initiative, but also one that enabled us to connect um, the older members of the society to the younger ones. And uh, uh, I think this is something that needs to be strengthened because it was very satisfying in the sense that for many senior lawyers, they viewed it as an, uh, viewed it as an opportunity to give back, but there was immense value that was coming from the, um, that uh, the younger ones were also getting. Um, one of the key challenges uh, we found was that um, the ELS Council was too large and therefore expensive to run, particularly when uh, uh, the funds were dwindling. And so uh, we, we, we reduced the size of Council uh, to about half of what it was. And I think that has helped us to run the organization much more efficiently uh, without uh, burdening it with the overheads of um, uh, conducting uh, in-person meetings, especially. Um, we have observer status at the ESC summit. But for a long time, that observer status was not put to, 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 to great use because uh, as an organization, there was insufficient resources devoted to research on the basis of which ELS could give position papers or even undertake uh, uh, other advocacy um, uh, activities, particularly when it came to, to, to trade. And we initiated um, uh, a process through which we would conduct uh, research and then use it as a basis for, for, for advocacy and for, uh, for, um, and for uh, lobbying with uh, the various organs uh, of the society. Uh, at the time we left office, I think one, only one research project had been conducted, but I'm reliably informed that more uh, are going on. Uh, therefore, in light of uh, everything we did uh, over the two-year period I served as, as the leader of the institution, we, we felt that these initiatives were assisting members to feel part uh, of uh, the organization, but also uh, enabling them to remain engaged on the bigger, um, on the bigger uh, project of ensuring that as East African lawyers, we play the right role in ensuring that the East African project itself uh, succeeds. So those are my few remarks. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions should they require my personal um, attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Mugesha. And I think you're just being a bit too humble about 
the transformative nature that, uh, that you and your council uh, embarked upon when you took office in 2016. Indeed, you formulated a new strategic plan, which among other things produced for us the ELS Institute as a wholly owned institute of ELS, uh, and which has the capacity to do physical face-to-face -face meetings, but also virtual meetings, which is part of the reason why in this region, ELS was one of the first of the lawyers associations to go very nimble uh, on going fully virtual when COVID-19 hit us. But also in your time is when you managed to remove us from paying rent and your team worked very hard with your CEO, Annington Amor, my brother, and bought a property at plot 310 stroke 319 in the PPF area, the AGM area of Njiro Road. So now we have ELS house and we don't pay any rent as part of our self sustenance. So there's quite a lot to be said there. I'm going to ask our president, Willie Rubert, to come in now. I know he had spoken earlier and had put some of his remarks, but we're now on the onward march from the past to the present. So President Rubert, if you have anything or two you want to say about uh, some of the things that have been done over the last two years, then I will invite our president-elect, who will be the 12th president of Palu, Mr. Bernardo Undo. He'll be our president from 2020 to 2022, to give us a snapshot of his vision for our future. And hopefully we'll still have a few minutes thereafter, apart from the, interact from the chat that has been going on, to see if we can hear from part of the audience. So President Hubert, if you're available, I'd like to invite you now to just say a thing or two about your own time, which is soon coming uh, uh, to an end, end uh, as our leader. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don. Uh, thank you for giving uh, me this opportunity to put uh, some comments. So uh, uh, during my two years uh, tenure, what we did, we have been doing, we continued the implementation of uh, the strategic plan and uh, we focused uh, on uh, three, three, uh, three areas. Once it was uh, to engage more our members, to increase uh, income, and uh, to build uh, of uh, the self-sustaining uh, of our institution. So we have done um, uh, many, uh, for the first point, we have done many, many trainings for lawyers for, um, and uh, those trainings uh, had become cheaper because we are using uh, online trainings and we can get more people involved uh, and uh, at, 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 uh, at a really affordable price. And uh, we have done uh, many many uh, trainings on uh, really accurate question of, of law, uh, like uh, uh, cyber criminality, we have done uh, um, those kind of uh, trainings that really uh, lawyers need for the moment. Because uh, before, before I used to be, uh, to participate in uh, uh, ELS trainings, it was linked mainly on uh, human rights law. Now we extend that to commercial commercial law. And uh, the other thing uh, which is really, really important for me, uh, even if we had uh, this pandemic, COVID pandemic, we did our best with uh, the, 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 uh, the council to, to, to be ready for the transfer of leadership, which was quite challenging for us. As people, uh, we did not have any opportunity to organize the physical meetings. And also the other thing we did in the same line uh, as the strategic plan, it was to reduce where it wasn't necessary to have a physical council meeting. We did many meetings online and that allows uh, ELS to keep that money and to, to use that money for program for trainings for our members. And uh, I, I, this is also an opportunity to say that council members acted as ambassador within their uh, law society 
to bring people uh, to be aware of the the importance of our organization, to understand what we can get from ELS, and uh, I think that will, is really a success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Rubea. Indeed, you have, in your time, helped to institutionalize completely the Institute to remove us from uh, dependence on donor funding and to focus on having higher quality uh, training interventions, yet at a cheaper cost to the members, which has enabled us to focus on commercial law and arbitration and on the cutting edge of infrastructure and energy law and so on. So it's really been an upward journey and, and we are glad to, you know, glad for that. It shows our growth. Uh, I'm going to invite Pre President, Ban President elect Bernard Oundo to come in now. President Bernard, in a sense, is the beginning of a fourth cycle of leadership of ELS. Uh, in the early years when we were only three, we had a cycle that would start with the presidency in Uganda, then Tanzania, then Kenya. Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya. So we had two cycles of that. Then we started with uh, Dr. Alan Shonubi in the 2009 to 2011 period, a third cycle which now had Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya, Rwanda, Burundi. And President Rubea is completing that cycle now. So we're now starting our fourth cycle. Who knows where maybe by the time we're done, we'll also have our first president from uh, uh, South Sudan. Uh, and very soon we go back again to having some female presidencies. We had Zanzibar too. The... Sorry? And? We had Zanzibar too. Zanzibar too. <laughs> yes, yes. Although they would interchange with Tanzania, but yes. So, uh, President Owundo, I'd like to invite you now to also just give us your reflections, the past, the immediate future, and so on. Uh, and then we try and get more interactive. Thank you. Thank you, Don, for the kind introduction. Thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to share my insights on the future of the East Africa Law Society, how I see it and uh, what I think in my view we need to be able to focus on. Before I actually share that, I would just like to thank the founding members for the vision, but more importantly for the implementation. You know, when um, Mr. John Mary Mugisha, senior counsel shared, he said the first meetings were held in Washington. They didn't wait to come back to East Africa to, to start the implementation of the idea they had. They right away did that. And I think for me, that is a sense of what we need to do with East Africa Law Society. There is a sense of urgency and we must, we must be able to implement as quick as possible. Let me just change my camera. Should be much better. And, and, and for me, that, that is inspiration enough. Um, uh, if our founding fathers didn't find time to come back to East Africa, to start the process of implementing an idea they had birthed in the US, it means that our current generation and current leadership must act with urgency and implement the sort of ideas that we want to do. Um, and, and, and I'm sorry, I can't hear President Owundo. I don't know if it's just my internet or it's more than me. Can't hear him either. His screen may have frozen. Okay. Uh, I think we'll get back to him as soon as we can. Um, it could be a temporary internet problem. You know, all our countries are suffering in this, uh, during this difficult period. So I was just gonna say, thank you very much. A number of comments have come 
through in the chat box, some have been answered. I think there was a very important question of how exactly do we help young lawyers in what they are facing in country and trying to join the profession at a very difficult economic time for us in each of our countries and region. I've seen some comments that have been made by our CEO, Huntington Amoro there and said that there will be some things to be launched tomorrow during our annual general meeting. Um, still, I will invite uh, the panelists or the conversationalists when giving in their closing remarks to also touch on it if they will. I'd now like to allow one or two or three of our colleagues, I know time is out, I know we're told to finish at four o'clock. I beg your indulgence if you allow me. Sorry, one or two or three people who may have raised their hands, we can allow them to say something very quick so that uh, we have heard from the conversationalists, but we've also heard from our members. So anybody would like to take the floor, something brief, a question or a comment or an insight? Hello. Hello, President Tund, are you back? Can you hear me? It's breaking up quite a bit. It seems the connection is not very strong. Hello? Hello, that seems better. Can you try and go now? Yes, yes, I'm back. Can you hear me? Are you able to? Yes, yes, go right ahead. We don't see your video, but at least we hear your audio. So please go right are ahead. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we are. Yes, I, let me try and go now. I've changed the connection. My as I said, we, we, we are taking over an interesting, and in, a, in an interesting time. We have a global pan pandemic. We have the ESC process that we need to focus on. We also have uh, different countries as uh, the honorable man out. We need to be able to speak out on, on, on issues to do with democracy and good governance in line with the vision of our forefathers. And therefore, we will focus on about four things. Number one, we will focus on enhance to work with the national lawyers in Kenya, Tanzania, in Rwanda, in Europe, in Kayonza, in Burundi. We must be able to, to support our national bars and see how we use technology to deliver uh, world class trainings. Number two, membership engagement. I think, as our founding um, speaker and member has indicated, there is there is some sort of uh, disengagement from the members. So I'm going to try and focus on, on engaging our members and show the relevance of the East Africa Law Society. Three, we will need to take use of our observer status, as President Mukisha pointed out, and support the integration of the East African community. And that is also going to be very key. And lastly, as I indicated, in line with the vision of, of our founding members, we must contribute to the building of democracy and good governance in East Africa. So thank you, Don, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, we'll be able to share our vision and plans in the near future. Uh, this is just the highlight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President-elect Bernard Oundo. We really look forward to your presidency and we, your ordinary members, look forward and promise you our utmost support and participation to help you achieve what under your leadership can be achieved for our profession and our people. Ladies and gentlemen, even though I didn't want this party to end, it has to end. I've been, I've been reminded that the people who've taken a break from their office work from 12 noon and they'd like to get some work done before they have to go home, especially those that live under curfew. So I'd like to revert back to our conversationalists, each like a minute each, just final words, any final word they can give us. And then the chat, of course, and the Q&A continue. And then at the very end, we'll invite in our CEO, Huntington Amol, will give us a housekeeping and the arrangements for an annual general meeting tomorrow and of course hand over to his own leadership. So going back to the very beginning, JMM Mugesha, 
Any famous last words from you? Uh, hopefully a minute or less. Hello? Do you get me? Yes, we can hear you. Go right ahead. Oh, I would like to express my gratitude to all the conversationalists. I would like to thank my senior colleague, uh, Mr. Wamai, for those uh, remarks and all those who contributed to the discussion. And indeed, uh, I have, I think we have been vindicated. What initially we thought was a pipe dream, it has now become a reality. And I think the future is bright. We have only to uh, redouble our efforts to win back our membership. We should try and remove the apathy, especially among those who think that they do not benefit anything from our society. And I would like us to take stock and see whether we can reposition ourselves to keep abreast with the developments, technological, as well as the political. And I think given all the support that has been expressed so far, the sky should be the limit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, JMM. And moving on swiftly to Senior Council Paul Wamai. Senior Council Paul Wamai, some final word from you, please. An invitation by National Bar Association that we do twinning. That will give that will give some attraction or some uh, value, particularly to the young lawyers, to travel to the USA and work for some time. And also, we can invite some of them to come over and join us. The other thing is that we, as the founding members, we're not so much concerned with any personal benefits that we could reap from being the members of East African Law Society. We are motivated by more noble objectives, which Mr. John Mirimogish has so well stated. And I would like to ask, particularly the, the young generation, to think of the future, because sometimes you might think there is nothing to gain by a certain project which with some kind of patience, it will be quite beneficial to the members. So I would like them not to be so much personal about whether or not they are gaining some benefits from the South African Law Society. And to have, to have a more patriotic have a feeling about being members of East Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senior Council. Um, uh, Wamai, I'd like to now invite uh, Honorable Martha Karua, who is also Senior Counsel, and I'm sorry that I didn't specify that when I called her earlier. Honorable Martha Karua, Senior Counsel. Thank you, Donat. I would like to congratulate the past, current, and incoming stewards of the East Africa Law Society, tell you that from where I sit, we are firmly on course and I'm excited that the incoming chair will focus on strengthening ELS and also the local bars and also on membership. We will be at hand to work together with you to achieve our objectives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Karua SC. Next, I'd invite uh, our learned sister, Anne Abeja. Anna Beja, some famous last words from you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Don. My last words um, will be words of encouragement to the incoming leadership, but also a request to our membership to be very patient with the East Africa Law Society. I know that one of the biggest challenges has been um, the Law Society being able to demonstrate are the value to its membership. And uh, I do believe that uh, ELS at 25 
is much uh, younger than some of our countries that are in their 60s and still grappling with a lot of issues. So I also wish to point out that we are mindful that 70% uh, of our membership, of our 17,000 or so membership are young lawyers who have changing needs uh, like the rest of us, but their needs seem to change much faster. And we believe that there's no better time than now, especially because of the opportunities that have been presented by the COVID pandemic. I think that co the COVID pandemic has been one of the um, fastest triggers of uh, the need for the world to move with technology and to digitize. And I think with that comes a lot of opportunities. So the EALS will be able to cater to the needs of the membership and be closer to the membership uh, by leveraging on the technology uh, that we have been thrust uh, into at this point in time. So thank you very much, uh, the organizers, for the opportunity uh, for me to speak amidst a very eminent panel. And uh, I thank our listeners. Have a great afternoon and evening. Thank you very much, Anna Berger. Next, I'll invite our senior counsel, Rosalyn Odede. Rosie, <laughs> let's have some hey. last. Don, thank you for dreaming that I'm senior counsel, probably <laughs> soon. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I would like to just encourage uh, ELS uh, members to support the society. This is our society, and it is up to us to make it grow. We can see where it came from all the way from America to here. Uh, the people who had the vision are still here with us, and it's our duty to channel this vision forward and make it grow. So let us support ELS by paying our subscription, taking part in its activities, and generally trying to see this grow to a better space. Thank you all very much for being here today. Thank you, our forefathers, for setting this up. And thank you for those coming behind for taking this forward. Asante Nisana, have a blessed evening. Thank you very much, Rosie. Next, I invite President Richard Mugesha. Thank you, Don. Um, uh, this is just to say um, uh, we have a lot of more work to do. Uh, fortunately, the imperatives of uh, pursuing the broader East African project and uh, attending to individual um, member needs are not mutually exclusive and should be um, uh, pursued at the same at the same at the same time. And uh, I would I would like to pay special tribute to. Uh, Huntington Amol and our colleagues at the Secretariat, you know, they they do the heavy weight, weight lifting uh, of the work and they really made us proud. They are really responsible for much of what we have achieved uh, so far. Uh, of course, they were preceded by Don Dare and subsequent uh, uh, CEOs. And so to all of you, we couldn't have gotten where we are without your efforts. And uh, thank you very much. And um, my brother Bernard, uh, I know what you are about to undertake and feel free to call on me whenever you need me. Thank you and have a good week, everyone. Thank you very much, you. President. I would now like to uh, next invite for final words, uh, his final thoughts was from President Willy Rubea. President Rubea. Thank you so much, Don. I just want to thank uh, all the panelists and uh, to thank also the former governing council because uh, uh, it's with uh, the, the strategic plan you have been, been able to handle some issues and uh, we have got uh, uh, any time needed, uh, uh, the former president has uh, got time for us for discussion. I just want to also to encourage the upcoming council. They have work to do, a lot of work to do. As I said, we need 
what is requested is to bring back ELS to its members. And I'm sure uh, the upcoming council will be able to, to, do, to do so. I just want to repeat one, one, one sentence I, 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 I've heard from uh, Mrs. Rosalie. Uh, for lawyers, ELS is where to be, to learn and to grow. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Trubert. And now full circle, we're back to you, President-elect Bernard Oundo. Is President Oundo there or maybe he have dropped out? Yes, I'm here, Don. Just okay, putting on my microphone. Ahead. Yes. I, I want to take this opportunity you Don for hosting this panel. I also the governing council, the CEO and the giver they have given us. I would like to kindly request for the support of the membership as we continue the journey of the East Africa Law Society for the next 25 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President Electro Wundo. President Mugisha, in his remarks, of course, uh, uh, spoke about those who uh, have preceded Amol um, in heading our secretariat and so on. And, and let me just acknowledge them as I myself wind up. Before I came into the secretariat on 1st June 2002, uh, Previously, in uh, the year 2000, our second president, Coleman Mackengalo, had tried to establish a secretariat, which was headed by our brother, Julius Vincent Sabuni. He's still in Arusha, practices now, after spending um, a good amount of period in advocacy, especially around HIV and AIDS. Uh, so Julius was, in a sense, or was actually our first executive secretary. When I negotiated with our third president, Zamba Kitonga, the late, may God rest his soul in peace, we're very, very lucky that of all our presidencies, of all our 12, our 11 current presidents, that's the only one we have lost thus far. I told them that I didn't like that title of executive secretary. We wanted something more corporate, more crisp, so that we'd be seen as people coming to execute and not just sit at the back and wait for the board to do all the work. So in that sense, I became the first CEO. Uh, when I left in January of uh, 2010, my then colleague Alice Naebare replaced me in an acting capacity with anchor for her own contribution. She had been a substantive program officer before. Then she was followed by my brother Tito Bianchi Kugonza, who led us for several years. Tito had previously also led the secretariat of the Uganda Law Society, and even at, as at ULS had been a very active supporter of ELS. We used to crack the joke then because Uganda Law Society has a very huge legal aid uh, project, uh, which has at that point in time had over 70 lawyers. We used to say that he reigned the biggest law firm in East Africa as at the time. Of course, since we were getting bigger and bigger law firms coming in. He was replaced for a short while by Patrick Okoth and Patrick is the one who handed over to my colleague and friend Huntington Omondia Mall. So we congratulate them and we thank them, especially the team that we have now at the Secretariat. There's Maureen Akokelo, uh, who's uh, uh, Chief of Staff in the Office of the CEO, but is also a mistress of almost everything. Uh, and is part of the oldest institutional memory we have now at the Secretariat. We have Achileo's uh, Rolamira Romwad. I'm sure maybe you're not seeing their faces, but you can be sure they're working very hard behind the scene. And we have David uh, Mungosi, Singano, and of course, Huntington Amol. So we thank you all. We celebrate you for the work you do to breathe life into the directives and direction given by our elected leadership and our membership and to keep us alive. I mean, it's very hard for people to imagine that it's literally four people and every once in a while, an internal two that gets the work uh, that uh, we see done at that level. On behalf of PALU, the Pan-African Lawyers Union, I'd also just like to celebrate our partnership and our friendship. Of course, ELS is an institutional member of PALU, a very active and supportive one. There are periods in our history when that support had kind of went down a bit, but literally from the time of President uh, Richard Mugisha, 
we've been hand in glove. We are lucky to, you know, also be neighbors in the same city. And we're able to talk a lot at our level. And we do know that our leaders also talk and we look forward because a lot of work has to be done. We've seen President uh, Oundo's four-part agenda that addresses everything from our public interest obligations, especially at a time of democratic regression, which Honorable Martha Karua also talked about, but also building the profession. And we are also getting, even though Huntington Amol has given some answer and there'll be some more detailed answer at our AGM tomorrow, we really hear the, the, the plea of our younger colleagues that even though things are thick, even though the national law societies are trying, what more can the regional law society do to help build the profession from the ground up, especially those at the start? I will end with one short story, uh, which is more public interest. Uh, and just to show the importance, as Anna Beja said, of we building, even if it's with $10 a year, $20 a year, $50 a year, our society ourselves. The president of Tanganyika Law Society, who took Tanganyika Law Society out of the compulsory membership of uh, ELS, was Tundulisu. Tundu got elected in uh, March of that year. Actually, it was closer to May, May of the year 2017, at a very difficult time in the country. He had faced a lot of difficulty himself uh, as, as a candidate uh, and so on. And uh, there had been a motion, an agenda item, at that meeting for the removal of the compulsory membership. Because of the hustle and bustle of the AGM, that motion was not arrived at. So it was not discussed. So we kind of thought we had bought some time until the half AGM of uh, TLS, which traditionally takes place in August. But in June, at the first meeting of the elected council led by Tundu, they decided, well, the motion had not been passed, but we'll do it anyway. And despite some pleas, they removed TLS from uh, ELS, uh, compulsory membership, that's individual membership. Very unfortunately, only two months later, in September, I think on 17th, Tundu was the victim of an assassination attempt. 38 bullets were shot at him, 18 of which made his way into the body. And uh, one of our first spots of call, I got called. Uh, I was in the US then, so it was very early morning for me. So I was just beginning to read my news. I got called, I called my colleagues and we called the ELS council. And the ELS council jumped on the thing and Eric Chalomutua, who was then president of LSK and chair of the ELS, uh, and uh, a member of the ELS council, was able to for call his former client, Dr. Cleopa Mailu, who had been CEO of Nairobi, Law, uh, Nairobi Hospital and had just been made minister in the cabinet of Uru Kenyatta. The long and short of it is with these high level contacts and the push from the six regions, we were able to evacuate Tundu Lisu into safety and he was able to survive. And even though he will live with some of those injuries, uh, he's been able to walk and try to achieve what he could for his country, for our region, for our continent. The month after that, we came to Da to offer us Palu to offer solidarity to our colleagues who are feeling a bit rained on. And we told them, you see, this is the reason why bodies like ELS, the bodies like Palu need to have resources, human resources, technical resources, financial resources, so that when something needs to be done, we're able to do it immediately and we're not running around with a begging bowl. And this extends from our public interest and human rights mandate to building our profession and helping our younger colleagues. On that somber note, uh, learned colleagues, let me hand over to my colleague, Huntington Amol, so that he can give us the housekeeping for tomorrow, he together with his uh, leadership. Thank you for your patience and for your active participation. Thank you so much, Don. I think that was a passionate uh, you know, conclusion, literally took the wind off my sail. And uh, I have to sincerely thank you for you know, a well-placed moderation. I don't know if there was anybody who could have done it better. Uh, the ELS Council chose you for this role specifically as we climaxed our conference because of the part that you've played in the history of ELS. Literally, whenever I move, it's hard introducing myself as the head of, as the CEO of ELS. So I call myself the head of ELS secretariat because whenever I say I'm the CEO, people say the, the only person they know is down there. So 
Formerly, I'm the head of the ELS Secretariat. Don't dare remains the CEO. But thank you so much. Uh, I'm glad uh, the people who mentored me, Richard Mugisha, Willie Dubair, were able to speak uh, this afternoon. And I'm glad that we have a vision to live with. And for the very first time, uh, people might be shocked. Uh, hearing John Mary Mugisha, Paul Wamai, Martha Karo and Ross Nodet speak about the EC. That's one part of ELS that I've also not encountered. I'm very young. I joined the bar in 2010. That's the first time I also became a member of ELS and properly interacted with it. So I'm also glad that I was learning this very part of the history and how I hope that many other contemporaries of mine could join me in ensuring that we walk this journey. As I say, our role at ELS is very temporary. Uh, we, we, we build what we can maintain what is possible, and we leave to the future generation to carry it. And if the, the generation that started it was selfish, as Mr. Paul Wamai said, they were not selfish, then we would not have this organization. How I hope that even with the difficult circumstances that we still hold together. Uh, I am quite concerned about two things, and I believe while the past leadership and the present have tried to address them, there's still more opportunity. One is about the plight of especially uh, young lawyers uh, who are just joining this profession. Uh, economic opportunities are constricting and things are getting as more difficult. But I believe if we go by what we looked at in the morning when you are revisiting the common market protocol, then the East African Law Society, working with partners like the institutional members, the National Law Society and partners like Pan-African Lawyers Union and IBA, we should be able to create a bigger cake by just ensuring that laws are respected. If we could all work together to ensure that, that the common market protocol of this African community is implemented to the latter, then we shall have created almost 300% more opportunities than we have in the current market. The second concern, and this concerns all of us, and I'm glad Honorable Mata Karua Senior Council has raised it, is the issue of constricting civic space in the region. That is something we should not be shy to talk about. Uh, East Africa Law Society, even at the moment, uh, our operations are threatened. We get disrupted by little things like work permit and residence permit, which ostensibly could be used to basically cut our wings or clip us when we need to talk about things like democracy. But we still should be able to talk about them wherever we are, whether we are in Tanzania or outside. And we should be able to speak about them in each and every East African community partner state. I only believe uh, that we are only able to achieve this if we hold hands together. Thank you so much. Now, this evening, we still have one more session. Uh, it is uh, a networking session for young lawyers, but literally, if you feel young at heart, despite the age, you can join us still on the same link. Uh, Barbara Maloa, the convener of the Young Lawyers Committee and the Deputy Secretary General, will be uh, having an exciting session with young lawyers, uh, basically sharing uh, their vision, uh, their aspirations, the expectations of the society. And tomorrow at exactly 2 p.m. Nairobi time, that's GMT plus three, we will be having our annual general meeting. It is designed to be short. As you know, online engagements cannot be long. And within that meeting, we'll also be uh, inaugurating the new governing council that will be taking over from Willy Rubea's council. So same link that we had shared, feel free to join and we look forward to seeing you. Thank you and have a good evening. <laughs>